ship Zion, it's home for the lost and dying, it's a soul saving station, the tower of salvation it's a church triumphant oh Lord and it's built by the hand of the Lord it's the old ship of it's hope for the lost and dying. It's a soul-saving station, the tower of salvation it's the church I am fine oh Lord and it's built by the hand of the Lord it's the old Ship of Zion, it's home for the lost and dying. It's a soul-saving station. Oh God, such tower of salvation that's for me oh God it's a church triumphant oh Lord and it's been by the hand of the Lord I'm talking about church in the book of Revelation it's built on the rock got a firm foundation it's been through the flood it's been through the fire by one of these days the church gonna move a higher it's a church triumphant oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord i'm talking about church in the book of revelation it's built on the rock got a firm foundation it's been through the flood it's been through the fire by one of these days the church gonna move a higher. it's a church triumphant oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord it's storm but the wind couldn't turn it it's been in the fire but the fire couldn't burn it fed to the lions but the lions couldn't eat it fought a lot of wars but never defeated well it's a church triumphant oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord i'm talking about church in the book of revelation it's built on the rock got a firm foundation it's been through the flood it's been through the fire by one of these days that church gonna move up higher it's a church triumphant oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord i'm talking about church in the book of revelation it's built on the rock It's been through the flood, it's been through the fire, 
by one of these days that church gonna move up higher it's a church I am final oh Lord and it's built by the hand of the Lord it's been through the storm but the wind couldn't turn it it's been in the fire but the fire couldn't burn it fed to the lions but the lions couldn't eat it fought a lot of wars but never defeated well it's a church triumphant oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord i'm talking about church in the book of revelation it's built on the rock it's got a firm foundation it's been through the flood it's been through the fire by one of these days that church gonna move a pyre it's a church triumphant oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord i'm talking about church in the book of revelation it's built on the rock got a firm foundation it's been through the fire it's been through the fire by one of these days that church gonna move a pyre it's a church triumphant oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord i'm talking about church in the book of revelation it's built on the rock it's got a firm foundation it's been through the flood it's been through the fire by one of these days that church gonna move a pyre it's a church triumphant oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord it's been through the storm but the wind couldn't turn it it's been in the fire but the fire couldn't burn it it was fed to the lions but the lions couldn't eat it fought a lot of wars but never defeated well it's a church triumphant oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord i'm talking about church in the book of revelation it's built on the rock got a firm foundation it's been through the flood it's been through the fire by one of these days that church gonna move a pyre it's a church i am fine oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord i'm talking about church in the book of revelation it's built on the rocks foundation it's been through the fire by one of these days that church gonna move a pyre it's a church i'm fine oh lord and it's built by the hand of the lord let's clap our hands of the lord hallelujah Whoa. i had nothing but trouble and sorrow I was seeking for fortune and fame I had nothing but doubt and confusion but now I have everything. I have everything I need to make me happy. I have Jesus to show me the way. He has saved me 
And he gave me life eternal. And now I have everything I was making big plans for my future I was living my lifetime in vain till one day oh I prayed for life's only meaning and now I have everything I have everything I need to make me happy I have Jesus to show me the way saved me and he gave me life eternal and now I have everything I had nothing but trouble and sorrow I was seeking for fortune and fame. I had nothing but doubt and confusion. But now I have everything. Sing it with me. I have everything I need to make me happy. I have Jesus to show me the way. He has saved me and he gave me life eternal. everything I have everything I need to make me happy yes I have Jesus to show me the way he has saved me and he gave me life eternal and now I have everything I have everything I need to make me happy well I have Jesus to show me the way he has saved me and he gave me life eternal and now I have everything I dreamed that it was a basketball game. And I dreamed that I was playing in this basketball game and boy, the gymnasium was full. I mean, the, the bleachers were packed and there was, there was people standing around the edge of the out of bounds line. It was so full. And I was playing in this game and boy, I was scoring points left and right. And when it was all done, my team won, and 
And they lifted me up on their shoulders and they was carrying me off the floor. There was people everywhere, hooping it up, hollering. Right after that, everything changed. Everybody was gone. All the lights were turned out in the gymnasium. I was standing there all by myself. I sat down in the middle of that big gym floor and just wept and cried. And I guess God was telling me that when that buzzer goes off, then that's all there is. When all the people are gone, what are you going to brag about then? But I'm glad that he directed my path in a different direction before it was too late. I'm glad that God saw fit to redeem my life. A lot of people, if you'd have left it up to them, they wouldn't have kept me. But he kept me. Praise God. Let's turn to a one God passage. Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Seems like the Lord would have me to say a few things tonight. We may not be running and jumping, but I feel like this is what the Lord wants me to say. I'd like to say again, I appreciate so much the liberty that's in this pulpit. Appreciate your pastor. The more that I've been around him, the more I love him, the more I respect him. Appreciate Sister Elder. She's really a mother to this church. Praise God. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Jesus, we thank you tonight for your spirit. We thank you for this beautiful atmosphere. God, we pray that you would speak tonight, God. Pray, Lord, that we could hear. God, that our hearts would be tuned in to hear what you'd have us to hear, God. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' precious name. You can be seated. And while you're seated, turn with me to Luke, the fifth chapter. I'm going to take my time and just go through some scriptures tonight. I don't normally preach this way, but I feel like I need to tonight. Luke, the fifth chapter, and starting at verse 29, is one of three particular instances to where the Lord talks on this particular subject verse 29 of chapter 5 in Luke and Luke this is a prominent theme through Luke and Levi made him a great feast in his own house and there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with him but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples saying why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners Three times in the Bible, this allegation is hurled in Jesus' direction. Three times that I know of, and this is one of the three. Why is it that you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them that they, they that are whole need not a physician 
but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Three times the question is hurled his direction, and three times the Lord gives them different reasons for why he was a friend of publicans and sinners. His first reason was because a doctor is of no value unless he's where he needs to be. If a doctor's not treating the sick, he's no longer a doctor. If the doctor's not where they need him, then he's not doing his job. The Lord was saying, I'm a physician. I'm looking for sick people. That's why I eat with the publicans and the sinners. Because not only are they sick people, but they know they're sick. Because he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, a man, I found out, especially in reference to your teeth, if you'll ne- a lot of people will never go to a dentist until they get a toothache. And then they'll drag you to the dentist. You got to get me to a dentist. Why? What's the big hurry now? I'm hurting, that's why. And I can't stand it another day. Give me a man in the spiritual realm any day that knows he's sick. And not only knows he's sick, but is sick of being sick. You know, some people, they're sick and they know they're sick. I ain't going to a doctor. I'm not going. You're not budging me. I've had people in my very own family so sick and needing a doctor so bad. And I'm talking about not knowing the Lord now. I'm not saying run to the hospital for you get prayed for. But I'm talking about family that was outside the household of God. So sick, needing God, needing, needing God and a doctor. But they wouldn't go. They were so hard-headed. And it ended up they died because of what they had. But give me a man any day that is sick and knows he's sick. Jesus was saying, there's one reason that I mingle with these fellas is because they're sick and they know they're sick. A lot of times preaching and witnessing, we bat our heads against the wall, trying to convince somebody that they're sick when they don't want a doctor. And they are sick without God. But until they're sick of being sick, you'll never move them. You'll never change their mind. But if they're sick and they're tired of being sick, they'll say, hey, what was that you was talking about the other day? I'm interested. I was at work, and the fellow that I've been working with, I had no idea he was interested in God. He come up to me one morning behind the truck, and he said, Todd, I want to give my heart to God. What do I need to do? Man. They usually don't come that way. It's you usually have to hit them over the head a couple times and and work them over real good with the scripture. But I bet I hadn't ha- I hadn't said two or three words to him. I just lived the life in front of him. But he was sick of being sick, and this night he is baptized in Jesus' name. He's full of the Holy Ghost. And if he's doing what the pastor says, he's in prayer meeting right now. Praise God. Sick of being sick. In Luke, the seventh chapter, we find the second instance. Seven and thirty-six. I know this ain't the speed we've been going lately. I'm still sore from playing basketball. (laughs) 
And one of the Pharisees, verse 36, desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore which of them will love him most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. He turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. And I'd like to stop right here and say, sometimes the reason that we have trouble uh, entertaining the Lord in the house of God is because sometimes we forgot how much he's forgiven us. If it's still fresh in our heart and still fresh in our mind, we don't mind washing his feet with tears. We don't mind pouring the ointment on him. But when we've been around for a while and maybe we've forgotten, we don't give him a kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. There's another reason why Jesus mingled with sinners. Good old common sense. Because you take somebody that's lived in the filth and lived the trash lane of this life, they're going to love him very much. Very much. You can take somebody that they think in their mind has never committed a sin and according to the Lord's words, they're not going to love him as much as somebody that's been through the filth. And I'm not saying you had to be through the filth to love the Lord. And I, I think I'll just stop right here and say this. I remember one time at youth camp when me and my brother first prayed through, some of you here can remember it. I remember they thought we had a big, wonderful testimony because, man, we, everybody was spreading around. We was sinners deluxe. I can remember some of the young people standing around saying, boy, I wished I had a testimony like that. It brought tears to my eyes, Brother Elder, because in my heart and in my way of thinking, I wished I had their testimony. I wished all my life I had lived in the church. I wished all my life I had never committed the sins that I had committed. I wished all my life that I could say I had never been the places where I had been, drank the things that I had drank, consumed the things that I had consumed. I don't know what's wrong with our young people sometimes. I would think it would be a precious testimony to stand up and say, I've never been outside the church. I failed God, but I've never leaned on the world for my satisfaction. I wished I had that testimony. Praise God. And to those that's been through the pit, they're going to love him much. Let's look at the third place. Luke, the 15th chapter. Praise God. Verse 
verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Listen to who was hearing the Lord. Listen to the ones that were paying attention to what the Lord had to say. It was the sinners. It was the publicans. If you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord, we want you to know this church is your friend. We're here because of you. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, it's not because you're somebody important. It's because there's somebody that you can reach. I believe that. God does not fill people with the Holy Ghost just so they can be wallflowers in the, in the house of God. He saves them because there is somebody specifically in this world that their life can reach. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. There it is again. They thought they was really slamming him. But the Lord takes that as a compliment. And he spake this parable unto them. Now I want you to see the threefold way that God looks at the redemption and the reconciling of sinners. He spake this parable unto them saying, What man of you? And the following parable is not talking about I don't believe he's talking about the Lord being the shepherd. I believe he's talking about you Pharisees, you Sadducees, consider yourself to be shepherds. You gloat in the fact that you're good shepherds. You uh, pat yourself on the back because you take care of the flocks that you know of. What man of you having a hundred sheep if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. I believe that the first principle that God wants us to understand is that his men, his God-called men, are going to have the attitude and the spirit of finding those that are lost. And really, God wants the world to see some things in these three parables, and He wants us to see something. He wants us to see the lost sheep. You know what He wants the world to see? He wants the world to see the searching shepherd. The searching shepherd. I'll never understand why people in the world can be offended when a man of God will knock on their door and invite them to the church house. Because you see, the third reason for mingling with sinners and those that need God is it's only natural. It's only natural for a shepherd to go seeking the lost sheep. It's only natural for the man of God to come knock on your door to preach you a sermon that would somehow convince you and compel your soul to be saved. It's only natural for the shepherd to have the instinct to fight for the sheep that's in his fold. It's only natural for the man of God to deliver up his heart and his soul so that somebody can be saved. Amen. Jesus was telling these fellas, you love your animals, but you don't love men. You love the fleshly things of this world, but you don't love the spiritual things of God. What an indictment to those men that thought they were pastors and shepherds to Israel. But I believe that the Spirit of God today is telling the ministry, 
If you're my shepherd, you'll not be content with 99 stable people. But there'll be something on the inside of you that's going to have to leave the stability that you know of. And go out in the cold and the wind, maybe the rain, maybe the snow, looking for a sheep that's lost. Don't be offended if you're without God and the shepherd comes your way. Don't be offended if the preacher preaches and he preaches right to your heart. Because it's only natural for the man of God to preach at your heart. It's only natural for him to strive through prayer and through fasting and through reaching out by the word of God so that you can be saved. It's only natural. He takes that lamb, he puts it on his shoulder. The lamb has strayed. Maybe it's never known the Lord. Sometimes the pastor will take a newborn baby and wrap that newborn baby around his shoulders and carry the newborn baby. Some of the saints in the church might get jealous. I don't know why the pastor doesn't visit me. I don't know why he spends so much time with the new converts in the church. You know why? Because if the shepherd will wrap that little sheep around his neck, by the time he gets back to the 90 and 9, there's one little sheep that's going to be very attached to the shepherd. Amen. He won't let it walk. He won't let it, he won't lead it. When he finds a lost sheep, he puts it on his shoulders and carries it back to the fold. If it's a sheep that has strayed many, many times, I've read that the shepherd will actually take that sheep's leg and break the sheep's leg, reset the leg, and then carry the lamb on his shoulders. By the time that little leg is healed, there is such an affection such an attachment to the shepherd that it will never stray again. Amen. Pastor, why are you so hard on sister so-and-so? Why are you so hard on brother so-and-so? You see, it's only natural. For me, I don't like to break the leg. I don't enjoy making the sheep suffer. But I can see farther down the road if I can break that sheep's leg and carry it a little while. When the leg is healed, there'll never be any trouble out of that sheep ever again. You can never really understand the value of the man of God until he's had to break your leg and wrap you around his neck and carry you when he sets you down and those legs walk for the first time in a long time, there'll be such an affection for the shepherd. Such a, such a love for the pastor. I've had my pastor break my leg, wrap me around his neck. When I thought I was ready to do some things, he said I wasn't ready. When I thought I was big enough to do things, he said, no, you're not big enough to do these things. Broke my leg. But at the same time, there was an affection there. I knew he loved me. I knew he loved me. And when he set me down, when I could walk on my own legs, friend, I realized it was only natural. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Then he gives us a second phase. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? 
To me, that speaks of the church. The woman, if she loses a piece of the ten pieces of silver, that's the church. This is how God looks at the church's role in the reconciliation of men. If she's to lose one of those pieces, it's only natural. It's only natural for her to light a candle and go searching for that one piece. You do some background study, the ten pieces is the woman's dowry. It's the pledge of fixing to be married. It's, it proves that if she can keep that silver, she'll be worthy to marry the one that's waiting to marry her. And her reputation is on the line. Just like the shepherd's reputation is on the line. If he only wants the stable ones and he's not willing to brave the cold for the unstable ones, the church's reputation is on the line. If she's not concerned about the souls that are without God, her reputation, maybe even her ability to marry the one she's been waiting to marry is on the line if she's not the type to light the candle and go searching throughout the house to find the lost peace. Amen. You know, church, I don't know how it is in Hutchison, but I know in some places where we've been we forgot this. And you say, oh, you mean evangelism? No, I mean the idea of reconciliation. Why is it that we're so ready and so rash to condemn one another? I'm talking about brothers and sisters you sat by in the church house. Maybe even people that come in that need God. We're so ready to condemn somebody for something that they've done. You know why? I believe it's because we feel like that if we condemn them and write them off, then we are no longer responsible for their soul. Because it's easier to write somebody off than it is to restore them to the fold. It's easier. It's easier to say, she did this and she'll never be my sister again. Or somebody else might say, she sinned. And I don't want to get my hands dirty with her sin. And our reputation is on the line because something's been lost. And we would rather kill each other than to go through the trouble of restoring somebody to the house of God. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that you have love one toward another. He's not just talking about me doing things for you, you doing things for me. Because he said, even the publicans and the sinners do that. Even sinners, when family needs groceries, they'll bring them groceries. Even sinners, when the children need clothes, they'll bring them clothes. Even friends, when in the world, they'll do stuff like that for each other. So he's not, that's not what he's talking about. Jesus said, no greater love hath any man than this, that a man would lay down his life for a friend. But there's three words in the Bible for love. 
One is eros, which is sexual love. The other one is philo, which is the love of a friendship. And the third word is agape, which is divine love or God's love. When Jesus said, no man hath any greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend, the word is philo. It's not divine love. Because you see, even a friend will lay down his life for a friend. But Jesus' love go, goes a whole lot higher than that. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You have heard it said of old time, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemies. But I say unto you, I say unto you, the one who spoke the law, he spoke that you should love your neighbors, but nowhere in the Old Testament does it say you're supposed to hate your enemies. Amen. That's something the Pharisees picked up. That's something that false religion picked up and made it something that they were supposed to keep. Where along the road did we pick up that we're supposed to love the ones that love us and hate those that hate us? We picked it up somewhere but we didn't get it out of the Word of God. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for them that despitefully use you. Pray for them. You know what the divine love says? Divine love says this. Love your enemies. Pastor, find for me Luke 17. Start at verse 1. But we've got it in our minds that it's easy to easier. It is work. It is work. Wait till a brother has sinned and you begin to try to restore him. It's work. It really is work. Because first of all, you've got to make sure you're clean enough to help him. First of all, you've got to make sure there ain't nothing in your eye so you can help him get that out of his eye. Let me tell you something else, too. We find out a sin about somebody else, and you know the first thing we do is, oh, my God, I can't believe that he would do such a terrible thing. What are you, a super holy Joe or something? <laughs> pretending to be holy. Pretending to be holy. We act like we're shocked. Because a brother or sister has sinned. Is that the first time that sin has ever entered into the world? I'm not saying that we should treat sin lightly. What I am saying is that we ought to act like we're grown up enough to say, Sister, brother, this isn't the end. I'm with you. And by the help and the grace of God, we're going to pull you out of this thing. But some people say, oh my God, I'd never do such a thing. You filthy hypocrite. You would too. Oh, I'd never do what they did. Oh, yes, you would. You better be careful what you say. Because the devil hears the words of your smart aleck mouth. And he's going to give you the opportunity someday to do the very same thing that brother or sister fell into sin with. And you better pray to God that when you fall into that sin, your brother or sister's more spiritual than you are so they can drag you out instead of you standing off and condemning them for what they did. Read it, Pastor. One. He said this to his twelve. It is impossible. It is impossible. But that offenses will come. 
Somebody say impossible. It is impossible, but that offenses will come. I don't know why he stepped on my shoes. I don't know why she kicked my dog. I don't know why she gave me that smart aleck look in the middle of the church house service. Who do you think you are? There's only one that can justly be upset at offenses brought their way. And that's the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus said, let me tell you something, fellas. You're going to be offended. You might as well grow up and realize that people are going to make you mad. People are going to do things to you you're not going to like. People are going to upset you. And hear me, sometimes it'll be friends that you hold so dear to your heart. They'll turn on you. I'm talking about saints of God. I'm talking about people that you consider spiritual. I'm talking about people that you consider pillars in the house of God. They'll offend you. But now you know it's coming. Now what are we going to do about it? Read on, Pastor. Don't worry about taking revenge because God's going to take care of those that offend. Read on. If you're going to abuse the saints of God, you'd be better off to have a millstone swimming suit. then he should offend a saint in the church. You better be careful how you touch God's people. Hear me. You better be careful how you touch God's people. Because in God's eyes, those are very, very, very precious. 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 He died for them. He gave his life for them. Who do you think you are to try to destroy their soul? Oh, but I didn't say nothing to them. No, but you played the hypocrite in front of their eyes. You made them think it was all right to do something because they saw you do it. And you're offending them. You're causing them to sin by your example. I've taught young people, and let me say this, you may not ever have me back again, but I've taught young people. And the biggest problem that young people have is we expect them to live right, and the mamas and daddies in the church house don't live it. They see the hypocrisy, and they think we're asking more of them than we ask of the saints that are sitting on the pews. Maybe it's not that way here. Read on, Pastor, before I get in trouble. Take heed unto yourself. Number one, number one, if you're ever caught in that trap to where people have offended you, the very first priority is take care of your own stinking hide. And that's the hardest thing to do. I guarantee it's hard to do. Hard to do. Take heed unto thyself. Don't be ready to smite them back. Don't be ready to go to somebody else and blab it off. You know what brother so-and-so did to me? Well, he hurt my feelings. hurt my feelings so bad I don't think I'll ever come back to church again (laughs) 
I hadn't said a word. Pastor hadn't said a word. I remember one time a fella, I borrowed a tape from him and I listened to this tape and I gave it back to him and a couple of weeks later he came up to me in church and said, where's that tape I loaned you? I said, well, I gave it back to you. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. I, I distinctly remember handing it to you in church. So he went home got this tape out, came back to church. The next time we had church service, he goes, well, I guess you did give me that tape back. But you know what? Half of it's erased. I thought, good grief. How do I get out of this one? And I thought, well, uh, brother, if, if I destroyed your tape, I'll I'll buy you a new one. Well, you can't replace this one. You you just can't replace this one. I just want you to know. I just I really I really don't appreciate it. And I thought, well, because I had I had listened to it, and then my my little sister wanted to listen to it, and I thought, good grief, Tasha, did you mess this tape up? So the next time I seen Tasha, I said, Tasha, what did you do to that tape to mess that tape up? And she goes, what are you talking about? And I, I guess that I'd forgot. She, she walked back in the bedroom. She come back out. You know what she had in her hand? A tape. Nothing wrong with it. I guess I had forgot that she had it. I went back to the church and I walked up to this brother and I said, brother, here you go. He goes, what's this? I said, this is that tape I borrowed from you. You know, he didn't even say one word. He didn't say thank you. He didn't say I'm sorry. He didn't say it's no big deal. I got so mad, brother elder. I, I just almost burnt clear to a crisp just standing there because of the tongue lashing he gave me over the telephone. And he hasn't apologized to me till this day. But the scripture says, take heed unto thyself. I finally got down and prayed and got the victory over that thing. If somebody's offended you, and they still haven't asked for forgiveness. You just need to crawl down on your knees and say, God, forgive them for what they did to me. And I forgive them for what they did to me. Forgiveness is not for them, it's for you. God forgives their sins, you can't forgive their sins. You forgive them so that you can pray. So that you can worship in the church house. Otherwise, when you come into this place, every time you see them, oh, that stinking hypocrite. Oh, I can't even believe he stands there and raises his hands in the church house and acts like he's spiritual. <laughs> it just makes me so mad. And he's having the time of his life just worshiping the Lord and shouting and dancing and running the aisles. And here you are. Everybody in the church house can tell who's having spiritual problems. But he offended me. He hurt me. But you'll die lost without God if you don't forgive him for what he's done to you. And that person has your victory. You'll be washing the dishes. I can't stand him. Can't stand him. You'll be at the job and you'll and and you'll that hammer will miss that nail and smack your thumb and you say, It's all his fault. <laughs> Am I telling the truth or not? You know how it is. Take heed unto thyself. Read on, Pastor. If your brother trespass against thee, 
rebuke him. No, wait, 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 wait. If somebody does you wrong, say, brother, you did me wrong. Make sure you got a kind spirit when you do it. Say, bless God. I ought to just smack you down right here on this spot. <laughs> no, don't do that. Just say, brother. That's offensive to me. I wish you wouldn't do that. And then if he repents, you know what we do in Pentecost? We say, brother, you offended me. Get down on your knees and beg me. We really do. We're not Catholics. But we act like it. You got to do penance, brother, for all except you back. You got to get down and beg to me to make it right. You got to act right. You got to show me that you're sorry. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, forgive them. Peter thought he was being pious one time. He said, Lord, how many, if my brother offend me, how many times shall I forgive him? Till seven times? See, the, the rabbi said you only had to forgive him three times. Peter thought he was being all. He thought he was being a great guy seven times. Jesus said, not till seven times, but I say unto these seven times, 70. 490 times in one day. Have you ever tried to figure out how many times that is in a day? You take 24, divide it into 490, and you've got something like about, about every three minutes. I want you to think about that, about every three minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, Brother Butch. Would you forgive me? The Bible says you've got to forgive me or you can't be saved. Would you forgive me? Okay. What? Bro brother, would you forgive me? And that's not for them. I said it's not for them. It's for us. It's for me. Read on, Pastor. Till seven times in this passage, read on. If he repents, forgive him. Boy, this is getting monotonous. I forgive you, brother. And the disciples got go so shook up. Jesus was asking so much of them that you know what they said? My God. If I got to forgive my brother and sister so many times, you're going to have to increase my faith. Maybe that's what we need. Maybe we need our faith increased. Maybe we need to see on a higher plane so we can say, brother, I forgive you. Sister, I forgive you. Our reputation's on the line. As a church that reconciles men to God. We're not judges. We're reconcilers. Read on. This is tied in with what he just said. If you had faith as the, they asked for faith. He said, if you've got faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you can say unto this sycamine tree. Now, a sycamine tree is the only time that that word's used in the Bible. A sycamine tree was a special tree that had long, long, long roots. 
that reached way, way, way down into the ground. When you've got unforgiveness inside of your heart, you've got roots of bitterness like the book of Hebrews said that goes way, way, way down inside of your heart. But Jesus said, if you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you can say unto this sick of mine tree, be thou plucked up by the roots and planted in the sea. I don't have room for bitterness in my heart. I have enough trouble fighting the devil. I have enough trouble trying to save my own hide as to put up with the things you're doing to me. So I'm going to forgive you and forget about it and we're going to go on with Jesus. And so by faith in Jesus Christ's name, sycamine tree, be thou plucked up, plucked up by the roots. Oh, that's a whole other sermon when you go all the way back to the roots. And that's really the best place to deal with a problem. It doesn't matter what Joe told Sally, what Sally told Ben, and what Ben told John, and John told Susie, and how it got back to you. Go back to the very beginning, make it right, and forget about it. Forget about it. Come on. Forget about it. Oh, but Brother Nance, that, you're, you're just, this, well, you, you think it's easy. No, I don't think it's easy. It's one of the hardest things we do, actually, is to forgive a brother or sister. Pastor, find for me Matthew 18, start at verse 7. Ah, oh, there's not any shouting in the house tonight. But our reputation is on the line. You know why? Let me tell you something. I'll tell you later. Read, Pastor. Woe unto the world because of offenses. Offenses come, just like Luke said. Woe to that idiot. Go ahead. Now listen. Listen, if your hand offends you, cut it off. What's it talking about? Is it talking about if, if you can't control your physical hand, then go get your hatchet and whop? No, it's not, that's not what it's talking about. The hands refer to the things that you do. If the things that you're doing in your walk with God cause you to sin, cut them off. Another place said, if your foot offends you, maybe it's right here. Read on. If your foot offends you, the places that your feet carry you, if they cause you to sin, cut them off. Read on. Now listen to this. It doesn't say heaven. It's not talking about entering into heaven. It's talking about entering into life. What is life? Life is when you're born again of the water and the spirit. It's better for you to have a, restric a restricted lifestyle and be in the kingdom of God than it is for you to be doing anything you want to do and be lost. But I want you to notice when it's dealing with you, personally, you, it says, judge those things. We got it totally backwards. We're judging other people and letting ourselves go scot-free. We're forgiving ourselves of our sins, and we're judging our brothers and sisters for their sins. And we ought to be judging ourselves for what we're doing and forgiving our brothers and sisters. Read on, Pastor. Don't despise the little ones. I, 
about your eye. If you're watching something that causes you to sin, pluck your eye out. You know what? In the spirit, we've got people that's sitting here tonight that are without hands and without feet and without eyes. Because they would rather be in life than to go to hell with both eyes, both hands, both feet. Judge yourself. Jesus was saying, judge yourself. Judge. Paul said, if I would judge myself, then I would not be judged. What he's saying is, is if I would get myself in line, nobody else would have to put me in line. I want you to think about that. If you got your own house in order, then nobody has to come up to you and say, you're wrong. You need to straighten up. Read on, brother. Don't despise the little ones. Angels are watching. Read on. Listen to what the Lord said. I'm come to save that which is lost. Read on. Pass on down, brother. Okay, keep going. God doesn't want one to perish. There's not one he wants to perish. Okay. If your brother trespasses against thee, you know what we do? We do just what the scripture says. We get on the phone and we say, Sister Susie, you know what she did? And everybody in the church house knows what Sam did to you, except Sam. And usually the pastor, they always, he's second to last. <laughs> but the first thing we do is, he offended me, he offended me. And, and, no, and, and they don't even know they offended you. And I'll tell you something else, you'll hurt people and not even know it. You'll, you'll, you'll offend somebody and not even realize you offended them. And that's why the scripture says if a brother sins against you, go to him. Go to him by yourself. Amen. The scripture's idea and God's idea is reconciliation. But when we blab it all over the place, we're condemning them. And not only that, but what, you know, when I was a baby in the Lord, what a, a ghastly revelation it was when I realized that not everybody loved everybody. Man, I thought I was in the most wonderful place in the whole I, I thought this was heaven on earth. My God, this is wonderful. I mean, they love each other and, and they love me and I love them. And, and then one day, somebody acted like a devil and I thought oh no I'm in the wrong place and you thought the same thing <laughs> but if I offend you come to me and tell me if there's anything I can't stand is to hear it through the, the ungodly grapevine. Can't stand it. You ever had somebody call you up and say, I had a sister call me up one time and said, my husband is upset at you. I said, oh yeah. Oh yeah, because you did, you did this and you did, and well, I didn't even know what was going on.
come to me. Come to me if I've offended you. If somebody's offended you, don't bring everybody and their brother. And stand them off and say, boy, if you don't straighten up, and if you don't start living right, and if you don't start treating me right, then, then, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the whole world. <laughs> but the Bible says that if you tell him by himself, you've gained your brother. You've gained your brother. And you'll form a special relationship that wouldn't be formed any other way by going to him and him coming to you and nobody else knowing about it. Read on. You've gained your brother. Not 300. That's the truth. You better take somebody that can keep a secret. Take somebody you can trust. Take one or two. And take somebody you can trust. Take somebody they trust. take somebody they trust don't make it look like three people ganging up on one and bless God if I can't whip you and if we can't pray you through well then three of us can pray you through (laughs) in fact it would be helpful for you now listen to me it would be helpful for you if it's somebody that doesn't necessarily always agree with your opinion but they like Because the idea is not condemnation, it's reconciliation. Read on. Why is it that a lot of people won't even frequent a Pentecostal church? It's because they've heard church trash. That's just a bunch of hypocrites. Come on. Tell it to the church. Nobody else. The world doesn't need to know what's going wrong with us in here. They need to know what's going right in here in the house of God. And this is what I was going to say a minute ago. The reason we can't win some people is because they look at how we treat one another and they think, oh, that sister made a mistake and they kicked kicked her out on her ear. If I was to go to that church and I was to make a mistake, they would kick me out on my ear. How shall all men know that you're my disciples? That you have love one for another. When they see you offended. When they see you sinned against. And you've got the love of God inside of your bosom. And you can look at an enemy. Somebody that's treating you like an enemy. And you can say I forgive you brother. Let's go on with Jesus. Then the world will say hey. If I goof up, they'll love me too. If I mess up, they'll put their arm around me and help me make it the rest of the way. Read on, Pastor. He doesn't hear the church. church, 
a heathen man and a publican. That doesn't mean you write him off. That means you start all over again. What are we trying to do? We're trying to win heathen men and publicans. We start all over again trying to win them back into the kingdom of God. Our reputation's on the line, church. My word, I am taking up so much time. Hallelujah. The third parable is where he talks about himself. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods that fall to me, and he divideth unto them his living. He wanted his inheritance. I want my inheritance. But you don't get your inheritance until your father's dead. So if you're going to walk out of the kingdom of God, the first thing you do is you got to kill God. Come on. To get your inheritance. In your mind, he's got to be dead before you can walk out those doors and never come back. I want you to think about that. Can you kill God? Can you kill God's influence in your life? Yeah, you can do it. You can say, God, I don't need you no more. You're not my father no more. I'm leaving the house. Been nice knowing you. Toodaloo. That's just the way some people act too. God, it's been a fun party, but well, I think I'm going to go live it up for a while. But one day out there when he was sitting with the hogs and, and everything wasn't going his way, he didn't have any money and everything was going wrong and, and he got hungry, he said, don't even the servants in my father's house, they, they've got it better off than I've got it. I think I'll go home to my father. And this is the parable of the lost son and the waiting father. The waiting father. God wants us to know there's a searching shepherd. God wants the world to know there's a searching church. If the church comes after you and say, please come back to church again, it's only natural for her to do that. It's only natural. It would be unnatural for her to do anything else. But there's something else that's natural. God waiting on that lost son to come home. It's natural. It's natural. I can see the Lord sitting up there on the, on, on the roof of his house, looking every direction. I wonder if he's going to come home today. I wonder if he's going to come home today. I wonder if he's going to come home. I miss him. I want to see him back in the household. I want to see him saved again. I'm looking for him. I, I want him to come home. There's another son in the house. Now, we're still talking about reputations. But there's another son in the house that's, that really is, when, when, the, when the younger son comes home, the older son gets mad because daddy's happy. Daddy's happy and he's throwing a party and he's killing the fatted calf. And he's going he's gonna to have a big time and he wants everybody to rejoice because my son that was lost, he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. And I want you to know something. Those men in that land and in that day, the, the older men did not run. The elderly are highly respected. And young people always came to them. But I want you to notice what God does. He lays down what people think about him. And he runs to that son. He wraps his arms around that son, weeps and cries. I'm so glad to see you home. I'm so glad to see you. 
God lays down his reputation when somebody starts making their way back to the house of God because he's happy. He's rejoicing. He's thrilled to death that they're coming home. Kill the fatted calf. Let's throw a party because he's coming home, because he's going to be saved, because he wants to come back to the household of God. Amen. It's a matter of respect that the shepherd goes searching. It's a matter of respect that the woman goes searching. But God lays down his respect when somebody's on their way home. But there's another sad side of the story. There was another son got mad. And the Bible says that he was outside the house. Now, if he had been the way he could have been if he wanted to, it could have been enough for the father to just send a servant and tell that boy, come back into the house. But no. God lays down his respect again to walk outside the house would you come back in your brother's home it was meet that we would make merry it was necessary that we throw a party some some people leave the kingdom of God and go out into sin and God lays down his respect when they make their way home some people black backslide right inside the church house of God. And God lays down his respect to go out there and try to bring them back in. What's the difference whether you physically leave or whether your heart leaves? You're not in the house. And God's reputation, God's reputation is on the line. But he says, I think I'll make myself of no reputation. I think I'll make myself of no reputation. I think I'll go out and get that saint that heart that their heart is drifted away let's stand to our feet church you know tonight I don't know why I've said everything that I've said but if your heart has drifted away from God sitting right here in the church house the Holy Ghost is so delicately coming up to you and saying, would you come back into the house? Because you see, all that God is really concerned with right now is that you could be back inside of the household of God. That you could be reconciled. If you don't know the Lord, you're without the Holy Ghost, without baptism in Jesus' name. If you'll start that trip back to the Father's house, I know a God that's willing to lay down what people think of Him and come running down that long road and say, I've been looking for you. I've been looking for you. I've longed for this day when we could be reconciled, you and me. Bring a robe. Bring a robe and put it on him. Clothe his nakedness. I want you to kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. Because you see, I came into this world to reconcile men unto myself. Why is it Jesus, that you rub up against sinners and publicans. Oh, because, because I love them. Because I love them. 
I want to see them saved. I want them to see them back into the household of God. Why is it, Jesus, that you died? Because when I counted the cost, I could see that life in Hutchison, Kansas. I could see that soul. And I said, I want them. I want them. I want them just for me. I want them to be reconciled to the precious things of God. I want them to be reconciled. So if this preacher's cut your heart tonight, let me tell you, it's only natural. It's only natural. If you find the Father waiting for you, it's only natural. It's only natural that he'd be up on the house waiting for you to come home. If the church was to reach out and take you by the hand and say, come on, let's come up to the altar and pray. Don't be offended tonight. Because you see, it's only natural that the woman would want to find that lost thing and bring it back. And you know what? When that thing is found, rejoice with me. Rejoice with me. Rejoice with me. Because I found the thing that was lost. I found it. I found it. I found it. They're back home. They're back home. They're here. Let's throw a party. Let's not be sad. Let's don't be downhearted. Your brothers come home. I found the lost sheep. I found the lost coin. They're home. Kill the fatted calf. Who's going to play the instruments? Who's going to dance? Who's going to lead the singing? Who's going to be the one shouting? Who's going to be the one to wrap the arms around them when they come home? We've all got a part. We've all got a place in rejoicing. In rejoicing. Do you need the Holy Ghost tonight? The Father's waiting for you. The Father's waiting for you. The shepherd's searching for you. The woman is searching for you. If you're lost tonight, let me tell you what Jesus thinks about it. He wants you to come home. He wants you to come home. He wants you to come home. Saints of God, let's come to the front. Let's find us a place to pray. Oh, God. That's it. Come on. Let's all find us a place. Let's find us a place. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. It's only natural. It's only natural, God. Hallelujah. There's people tonight that need the Holy Ghost. I want you to know that God wants you to have the Holy Ghost more than you want to have it. God wants to see you in His household more than you want to be there. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God.
Quero 